Hi, everyone. I'm Barb. And Welcome I'm to Ed. the RDRV <laughs> Class Studio Q and A. Hey, everybody. It's Monday night. We are live here at the Conway Glass Studios. We got a lot coming up for you. I hope everybody had a great weekend. Uh, the weather was kind of like spring, I guess, but maybe a little bit crazy for some of you. Who knows? Now it's um, snowing <laughs> on the hi, West Coast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the RDRV Glass Studio. We're here tonight to answer all your questions about stained glass. So if you have a question, just put it in the comments or the chat below, and we'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, you know, guy, you guys know that working with glass is very exciting. Everything changes within the, the next time you do something with that glass or that product. So, you know, Barbara and I have been doing glass for over 30 years, and we're here to help you with your process, with your questions, hopefully give you some answers. And, you know, we don't pretend to know everything, and there's a, but there's a lot of people out here in our community, right, Barb? Oh, yeah. That may also have the answers to your questions as well. So just post them right there in the box. And we'll be happy to answer. And them. we're live on Facebook tonight, too. Facebook, yeah. Barbara tells me that Facebook has about a 10 minute delay. So, That's right. and I'm learning all this, y'all. And if it wasn't for Barbara, I wouldn't know anything. I don't know anything now, but I'm learning. <laughs> so, Welcome to the RDRV channel, everybody. Yep, we're here to answer your questions. Just put them in the chat. And how it works is you write your questions in the chat or the comments. I will read the questions and then Ed will answer them. And then we'll talk about it. I might put in my two cents. I don't well, know. Well, she could put in her four <laughs> or five cents would be fine with me because, you know, Barb has a lot of knowledge about this too. And she kind of, Barb looks at things a little differently than I do too. Yeah. Um, so when we when we work together on a project it's that's how that project comes together okay yeah because it's some of you may not have anybody to bounce anything off of you know but we uh, need someone to you, bounce yeah, ideas off of yeah just little just ideas it doesn't matter whether they're going to help you build the stained glass window or not but ask them a question you know bounce an idea off of them get their input and all what it does is open other doors for you. I think, right, Barb? Oh yeah. Is that how it That's right. That's right. And, uh, okay. So Julie is here. Mark is here. Uh, me, Mike P is here and CM is here. Hello everyone. Hey Welcome everybody. To the RDRV glass studio. I hope you're having a great week. Um, we're going to start off with questions that we had come in over the week but if you've got a question please go ahead and put it in the in the chat tonight we're going to do questions and answers right and then ed then we're going to go to um a glass chat about soldering irons and ed's going to show you the proper use and care of your soldering iron so that will include a demo as well yeah, it sure will. So stick around, you know, don't go anywhere. Those of you that are off in the background that haven't maybe subscribed to our channel, even give us a thumbs up. We hope that this will help you along with this new process that you're doing of stained glass and that maybe, or maybe you've been doing it for quite a long time. I'm going to show you the simple way to solder and I'm going to show you the best iron I've found for copper foil. Uh, and personally, I like it for lead. Can't wait to show you that during glass chat. So let's get to some questions, Barb. Okay. Um, the one question that came in, of course, on the um, the glue chip, does aluminum oxide come in different grit sizes? Yes, it does. The answer to that is, is yes. And we have not put the aluminum oxide on our website, on the merge page, because I'm not sure that um, maybe that we can find it again. But... At one time, we bought it from a company in California called CR Lawrence, and they are, uh, you may be able to Google uh, aluminum oxide, comes in a 50 pound bale. So your shipping on it's going to be a little stout, but they don't have to package it. It's in the bale. They stick the label on the lid and shoot it to you, but it does come in 50 pound bales and it's very coarse along with it being very, very fine. So for your sandblasting, You'll have to decide exactly what you want uh, because you, to me, I like the satin mm -hmm. on the glass, just that soft satin etch. And it makes t it to me, it makes a pretty glue chip. But you know, you if you're trying out the glue chip, 
go ahead and you know sandblast it. Use a different grit and try it. We, we use 120 grit. So. Okay, Julie would like to know, um, may I ask about that beautiful mission window behind you? Wow, Barbara and I were talking about this, and this, <laughs> we were talking about this we just, just a, I mean, we were just talking about it. it. So here, this is how we acquired this window. Barbara's mom and dad were out on an expedition one time and saw this window, and it had a couple broken pieces in it. And they said, well, you know what? I think Barbara and Ed would like that because it really went with our very first house that we bought. That's right. It was mission style. It was, craftsman, it was style, craftsman style huh? house. And actually our first house that we ever bought came in on three railroad cars and was fabricated. And then when those three railroad cars were empty, some more showed up and brought the rest of the house. It was awesome. Um, anyway, he wasn't there for that. that no, happened in 1925. That was 1925. So he's not reminiscing. He started. No, I wasn't story. there. But anyway, the this window, window here, <laughs> Barbara's mom and dad bought it and gave it to Barbara and I as a gift. Actually, mm -hmm. the glass wasn't missing. It was just cracked. So when we brought it back to the shop, my father um, decided that he would restore it for us. So he completely restored it for us. And we have had it in our house that we live in now for a while. And then it moved to the garage. And now we've brought it back here. We love it. And yeah, again, it was a gift, something from Barbara's mom and dad. Yeah. And from, and something that my father did and gave, and gave back to us as a surprise. So it does have a home. It will go to our little house up in uh, the upstate. Up in the upstate. Yeah. Yeah. So it, that's yeah. where it's going. And it's funny because, you know, we, we had a picture of it and Barbara's mom actually recognized it um, from many, 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 many years ago that she gave that to us. Okay. So Brenda's here. Hi, Brenda. And Hit Big Catherine is here from Ontario, Canada. Brenda remembers from Wichita, Kansas. Yeah, that's so right. So we got people from all over. Yeah, that's great. So. Well, thank you all for tuning in tonight. We're excited to have you here. And, you know, we had a, uh, last week, Barb, we got a, uh, we got a question in about an oval stained glass window at about oh, that's right. 10 after and four. I, yeah. Gig. I didn't get to and I think it. it was, was that Mark? Yeah. Was it Mark? I think it came to us like at 4.15. And so we, we have a cutoff on Sunday for questions so that we have time to gather mm -hmm. them and publish them. So we them. missed it. We, we sorry. Answer. Yeah. So anyway, the answer to your question is. Well, tell them what the question was. So the other. Yeah. I'm going to have to get up and get it because oh, it's in my book. Okay. Yeah. No, or is it? Yeah. It's okay. in my book. All right. I'll have to get up for well, a second. But I'll. We'll. In that book? Yeah. It's in that book right there. Okay. We'll get it. Okay. But, and we'll come back to it because. You know, one of your questions was, uh, you, you knew that it only needed a couple pieces of glass replaced, which is great. It needs it. The, looking at the frame, it just needed to be re, you know stripped and reglazed. The window needs to be reglazed. And as far as adding more reinforcing bar to your to that oval window, I notice there's two bars in there, and it it doesn't. They're pretty much aesthetically, they are aesthetically correct. Yeah, it kind of messes up the window a little bit, but this is a door. Keep in mind, the more that you can reinforce it, the longer it's going to last. And make sure when you're putty, and putty glazing around that window, around that lead, that you clean that wood thoroughly and paint that wood with linseed oil or that glazing compound will dry out in three months and you'll be back again. Now that was that the window that had like it was a bent panel. Was it a bent panel or was it just? It was a just, flat panel that, oh, needed, to that be, needed to be. Okay. Yeah, it okay. needed to be re reworked somewhat. Okay, so will he take that out of the window and then? Flat? I would I, because it was bowed. You're gonna have to take that window out of the frame, remove the reinforcing rod, and lay it down with the bow side up and just set a couple books on it and just let them yeah. let them go down that lead will go back unless you somebody's put their fist through it or something the reason that it's bowed like that is because it needs two more pieces of rebar and those two pieces of rebar should be eight or ten inches above from the top where the little crown is on the top and where the little crown is on the bottom at the bottom of that crown so technically or you should have four set four pieces of rebar 
in that window for that door. Okay. All right. Okay. Because so, I remember the question was, it's bowed and mm -hmm. can we put new, more rebar in it? And the answer is yes. And you can straighten it out. The other thing is, is you're going to need to reglaze the entire window and then reapply instead of two pieces of rebar, you want to apply four. Okay. Thank you, Ed. I just I ramble think it on totally sometimes. I confused some people, but uh, if we, we'll get those pictures because they don't really Yeah, understand. they don't see the picture, the but photograph. We'll, so. we'll share a little but bit more. But we did, we did want to let you, you know. Thank you for that question that came in about restoring. Yeah, and we did want to let you know that Sunday is our cutoff time so that we can get your questions out for Monday night. So. Yeah. Um, thanks for that question. Uh, Catherine, Hippie Catherine wants to know, can you explain the term hinged again? Uh, hinged um, again. having a hard time understanding, um, what it means. I don't think we talked about hinged, um, hinged. Uh, you, they're talking about a place where the, the, Stained glass has, they're saying a hinge. What it really is, is a faulty. Um, oh, from moving back and forth. A faulty. Um, it's flexing. It's flexing. Yes. Okay. So here's, Faulty design is basically what it is. Yeah. And you know, every. I mean, you can call it a hinge or whatever. Every time you close the door, it catches air. Okay. That door catches air and it can only catch it for so long. I think they're talking about sun catchers. So when they have a sun, are you talking about sun catchers? Um, um, say you have a like a rooster and you put that tail on there. Yeah, that would be a hinged piece. But if you if you wire the whole the whole chicken, it's not coming apart. Right. The wire is very important. That wire is very important. It takes a little bit of time. Charge more for your work and do it so that you don't have that hinge problem. Just take a little longer to finish that piece and you won't have that hinge problem. Right. Like I've and always. It, and it does have a lot to do with the, the design. Yeah, because it does. Because you don't have to put a solid piece of glass against a solid piece of glass. Right. You don't have you to do that. To... What you need to do is, is uh, take your cutting skills and show them off a little bit and bring, cut the inside of one piece out and sh put the other piece inside of it and now you you now you're cantilevering and it can't come apart but you've yeah. got to sun catchers y'all should have wire all the way around them if you're gonna hang them and sell them okay. because wire is not going to stretch and strategically you can do the wire correctly and make it look nice Catherine, I don't know if I'm right, but I'm understanding that a hinge piece would be two solid pieces of stained glass against each other, and they flex very easily. Yeah, like just that. like this. So you don't want to do that. What you would want to do is do a cut there, a cut over here, and a cut down. Yeah, there. you if you stagger your cuts, okay. You don't you don't have that hinge problem. But the other thing is, is with these three pieces of glass. You still need that wire all, all the way, way around, around them. Yes. And I, and you know, it, it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't take that much longer to do that, but it sure makes a better product for you and your customer. Okay. Uh, Christy is here. Susan B is here. Did I miss anyone? Um, uh, Susan B said she left a question. Uh, she left a question on my website, but didn't remember about the Sunday cutoff. You can ask it right now, Susan. Yeah, We're type just it talking in. about questions. We can't, we don't get a chance to get to our email and find out we have a question. That's basically what it is. So go ahead and put your question in the uh, questions. And I may have it here on my list. As yeah, because well. we're ready to start another one. Because I've been trying one. to go through my list and get all the questions answered. Um, okay. There are a number of U.S. glass makers plus Spectrum in Mexico, and prices vary widely, even when several makers offer similar color pattern alternatives. Do you have a preferred supplier, and if so, why? In this, you know, in this day and age, our 
our art glass suppliers, there's no one particular supplier any longer. You've got, uh, you've got like three or four and then, and then you can buy from the manufacturers and Barb will probably back me up on this. You can buy from the manufacturers, but you have to buy tractor trailer loads of glass from them. And they'll be happy to sell that to you, but you, you'll never use it, you know, unless you're going to be a, a distributor yourself. So here, here's what I found. I, I deal with a couple of distributors, not, well, yeah, distributors. One manufacturer, one of my distributors sell deals a lot of Wismac glass, and they're out of Payton City, West Virginia. I have another distributor that deals really heavily in Bullseye, Yakagani, and Kokomo. So Spectrum, I don't, I don't know anything about them. If they're in Mexico, that's probably where they need to stay. Why and is that? I don't know. Just leave it. They, they left. Cheaper. Uh, they left America. It's cheaper to reproduce down there, and the EPA isn't on their butts. I'm sure. That's why. It's so that's why it's cheaper because they don't have to have the scrubbers and all that stuff. So anyway, neither here nor there. Spectrum made beautiful glass for a long time, and then, you know, they left us all hanging. So. I would prefer if, if I was a distributor and could buy lots of different glasses, just use the companies that are made here in America. You know, Oceanside has really beautiful System 96 or tested compatible glasses. They're really pretty. Um, I Franklin Art Glass in Ohio, they keep a wide variety of different glasses, mainly Kokomo's. Uh, Yakaganis, Bullseyes. The other one is Ed Hoyes. Ed Hoyes requires you to have a lot of information to purchase from them. Again, Barbara can oh, that's vouch for, the for me. Account. Yeah, for a wholesale account at Ed Hoyes. Ed Hoyes is still the largest distributor of art glass in North America. A distributor, not a manufacturer. He is a distributor of art glass in North America. And he's got a lot of th different things you have to fill out and go through to get an account with, with them uh, and to purchase their glass wholesale. So, or, you know, you can buy little sheets. I don't know that they, that they'll do that. Uh, the big stuff without a wholesale account, but anyway, you know, Wismac, Kokomo, Oceanside, Bullseye, Yakagani, those are all companies that are manufacturers and, there are only like maybe two or three distributors in the country that distribute their products. So I, I found just in my restoration work, it is really, really hard to get these glasses. Number one, y'all, if, if you don't know the part number of what you're looking for or can't send those people a sample, say, you know, uh, sunshine up, up sunshine up in, in Buffalo, you know, Franklin Art Glass. And actually Kokomo, you can you can contact Kokomo and they have some of their glasses are online. Most of their glasses are 16 by 16s or 16 by 21s. If you need larger mm -hmm. sheets, they will ship them to you. With shipping, it's gonna run you about $225 for a sheet of glass. Uh, they If they have it, it's just going to cost you. But then again, you know, if you're looking for it, it, it's really hard. It's really hard. I have an advantage because a lot of the part numbers I know, and if I don't know them, I have the kits and these suppliers I've been dealing with for over most of them over 30 years. So, um, you know, and then I have one supplier that handles really unusual glass. And they're right here in my backyard in Greer, South Carolina. So and that's Palmetto Mirror and Art Glass Company up in Greer, South Carolina. I'm sorry, I'm just Thank rambling you, on, y'all. Thank you, Ed. It's important, I think. Thank you, Ed. Um, <laughs> as far as that uh, question, do you have a preferred su supplier? And if so, why? Um, my preferred supplier would be my hometown stained glass shop. Yeah, I would have a good relationship with them. Because once you have a good relationship with them, 
you can build on that and they're just a wealth of information and if you have a problem you can always go with them um so they're gonna help to make you. friends yeah. even if it's two mile a uh, two two hours away you know with a local glass shop and then just shop around online for the best prices the last resort go ahead go to amazon but i would definitely try to shop local first yeah definitely you know not hobby Lobby. no but, no you know, I, I saw something online yeah i mean on a show the other night about hobby lobby and uh, well, how, the, how just, they have a wealth of glass well their wealth of glass is not really that great so. i i i don't want to bad mouth anyone no, I don't i'm just either. saying the selection a hobby lobby to my knowledge is overpriced your local glass distributor is going to give you a lot better price and better quality glass that's my personal opinion and he's going to help you pick out what you need and if yes. you need it cut he'll probably even help you with that so i mean think about it okay we've got some questions they've been patiently waiting great okay <laughs> um christy how is that the first one that came oh excuse me did i miss someone uh oh mark mark said uh it was fun getting that out of the frame. Oh, I'll that bet. That winded we were talking about. Yes. I'll bet. I hope you didn't break anything, but and it did it have little little like uh tacks in it that were holding the lead into the wood? I'm just curious it because it'll kind of date the window. Uh if it had the little uh what do you call them? Upholstery tacks. I don't know in it. Okay. Christy's got a question. All right, Christy. How do you charge for a panel? By the pieces or by the square foot? She made a panel 32 by 21 and it had 100 pieces. Uh, the same customer wanted another panel, same size, but the pattern has 300 pieces. Uh, she said that she... What was the size again? 32 by what? 32 by 21. Um, 300 pieces. Uh, and she said she charged, did you, you say you charged more, but it wasn't enough. It uh, should have been, uh, $1,100. About $1,100. Well, for the 100 piece one or yeah, the no, piece? for the 32 by 21. And That's, if you charge by the piece, then you'll have to adjust it. But it's much easier to figure a square footage price for you. That was almost five square feet. And I just want to say, unless your panel absolutely needs 300 pieces, I would try to get that number of pieces down a little bit and spend a little bit more time cutting your glass. Yeah, because that's not 300 pieces.
Hey, are we back? Are we back? <laughs> we Sorry about like that. that. What in the world happened? <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh my gosh. We lost everybody. Wait. Okay, we're back. Okay. Our, we're oh, back. wait a minute. Is our microphone on? Are we here? I don't know, the one on the on the camera is working. Are we here? Okay. Okay. Can you hear us? They, I think they can hear us. Can you hear us now? Okay. Golly, y'all, that was something. That was scary. And it's not even <laughs> thunder or lightning here. It's just beautiful. Okay. Uh, is it disappearing act? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you see us? Say yeah. yes if you can see us. If you see can us. see us, yeah, just okay. say yes. Okay. Yes, we're back. Great. Okay. Great. Yeah. So you know when you're charging when you're charging for your Sorry. work, Christy, when you're charging for your work, you know there's there's only two ways to do it. I think uh, is either you charge by the piece. Some people charge two and three, four dollars per piece of glass. The other thing is is to come up with a square footage price that you can make a profit with. You know how how fast you can work. You know how long it takes you to cut the glass. You know how long, you know, come up with either a square footage price or a per piece price and stick with it. You can't keep bouncing back and forth. You're gonna find that the square footage price is probably gonna make you more money and pay for your materials with a profit than doing it by the piece. So that's just my opinion. We've been doing square footage since 1986. So, yeah, and you really have to look at your overhead, how much time it takes. You know, if you're if you're doing an intricate panel, yes, you're going to have to charge more by the square foot. Right. So you might want to have three prices: one for like cabinet door glass, one for original artwork that is pretty simple but you know beautiful, and then the, for that special customer that needs an intricate window and it, you're going to be spending a lot of time with them, I would increase, you know, have a price point, especially for sure. that type of customer. Cabinet doors are simple. Boom, boom, Working boom. Mm -hmm. And you're usually you're using window glass or a CD glass, something that's, that might only cost you, you know, $30 a square foot or something. So you have to, and, and you know that you can put, you know, a cabinet door together. You can maybe do two or three cabinet doors a day if they're small enough. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of keep that in mind for your customer and uh, usually keep in mind too, when you're doing cabinet doors, you're definitely doing, usually doing more than one, you know? So. Right. Uh, another question uh, that came up that's kind of in that same line, uh, what formula we use to charge customers? Is it different for copper foil than lead? Yes. Copper foil, you have to handle it so many different times. You have the window is fabricated differently. The process takes longer and you're handling the glass. Usually each piece of glass you're handling. I'm going to say three times after you, after you cut it, you're handling it three times. So yeah, copper foil work should be more expensive than lead mm -hmm. and restoration work should be more expensive than copper foil or lead. Okay. Um, let me see what questions I missed. Um, I think that right now, uh, uh, Mark answered your question. Um, he said that um, it had a few tacks. He'd never seen that. And okay. the outside you didn't seem to be soldered. Okay. No, it probably the outside you was soldered to the outside lead. But over the years, you got that hinge thing going. And you'll the glazing compound will actually help that process of the lead solder joints failing. So if you're not going to redo that thing, get you a good wire brush that fits inside your drill with a quarter inch armature on it. And you're going to have to clean that stuff really well. And don't forget, Ruby Flux, that'll help you. You're going to need it. Okay. Another question that came in, uh, and I can answer this real quick. Oh, you can answer it. You can is answer. it possible to get the recipe for your uh, putty that you use for uh, stained glass projects? You better believe it. <laughs> it's on our website. It is. And it's uh, you can purchase it right off our website. 
Okay. Um, lead cane versus foil. Is there any significant difference in cutting the pieces? Well, there is. Uh, um, the significant difference of cutting the pieces is you have absolutely, basically no room for mistake in your copper foil. And you really don't have any room for mistake in your lead. The only difference is, is instead of a 32nd of an inch you're taking off, you're taking off about a 16th of an inch, which is twice that, which that compensates for the heart or the center of the lead. That's really the only difference. And the, and the fact that copper foil uses five times the amount of solder that you use on lead, okay? Uh, copper foil requires, uh, I don't know, well, you still have to clean it, whether it's lead or copper foil. You have to putty the copper, the lead. You don't have to putty the copper foil, but you do have to patina it and frame it differently. So, you know what? I, I would, I prefer to do lead, but I do really large windows and I do those in sections. And those sections are usually not much bigger than three by three or three by three and a half, 30 by say 32 by 42, about nine square feet. I got to get comfortable. We were running around here like a couple chickens with our heads cut off. My God. <laughs> I was talking about chickens earlier today, but I realized I that you got to take care of on. them. <laughs> okay. I think we're ready for glass chat. Uh oh. What in the world? Okay. So um, let me see what we got here. We got. Uh, I got to get the camera. So we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna do a little bit of glass chat today, right? We're gonna do some glass chat. Yeah. Okay. Let me see here. Okay. You know that little thing, glass chat that Barbara pops up on the screen? I just love it. <laughs> I do. I just love it. You love it. I love it, man. I love it. So, okay. hey, everybody, we're going to leave the screen split because I'm going to be talking for a few minutes. Well, I, you want it? Okay. I'll leave it split. I can do that. Okay. <laughs> what? Well, we're now we're I back to the yellow that. paper. Could have. Woulda, shoulda, coulda. <laughs> okay. Here you go. It's come all on good. In. Let me scoot over. Come over here so they can see you. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. I'll come over. Okay. You know. You can get close. So I, I can get over here next to Barb. Yes. So before we start glass check, you know, I'm coming out there to those of you laying back in the background. We know you're there. Go ahead and subscribe to our channel. And if you if you like what we're getting ready to show you and this helps you, and I hope that it does, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. You know, raise and charge a thumbs up. And remember, the thumb is mine and Barb's favorite finger. And how about the bell? Well, you know what? If you're going to subscribe, you're going to want to ring that bell. Please. Because that bell is going to let you know every time we're live and every time we have a new video. And I will tell you this. Barb's got a new video she's editing right now. Yeah. Just want to tell you, I don't know when it's coming out, but we do have a new video. It's, yeah. And it's awesome. It's, it's going to be a premiere. So you guys will get a, uh, a notice. It, yeah, you'll get a notice ahead of time so you don't miss it. And we'll be live during the premiere. So if you have any questions while that's going on or you want to say, hey, yeah. we're going to be live during the premiere. I just don't know. I think it's going to be ready Wednesday, but uh, I'm trying to make it really good well and, and it's a yeah because it it needs to be so anyway it's a good one guys we're talking about glass chat and tonight we're talking about soldering irons i don't have a, a whole special bunch of different irons to show you because i only use two and i'm going to show you a lot of different things just a couple different things about your iron number one we're going to start at the very end when you're done with your soldering iron, you're going to turn it off while it's still hot. While your soldering iron is still hot. You see this? You're going to wipe it just oh, like that. Let me, get, let me get them a solo shot so they can okay. see what's going on. Because before you put your soldering iron away. Okay. There you go. Oh. Got it? There you go. Okay, so before you put your soldering iron away, that tip needs to look just like that. Do you see how shiny that is? There it is, right there, okay? Turn now, on. there you go, that was good. Okay, so any, there you go, you see that? 
Those of you that say, oh, well, how do you re tin your iron? Guys, if you've lost the tin off of your iron, we got to start all over. This is how you clean your iron before you put it away so that it's clean when you start working with it. Okay. So now I'm going to show you a what do, tip. What do you do to clean it? You just take your damp sponge and you wipe the tip and clean it properly. And that leaves, this is just solder on here. My tip is still tinned. This iron that I have in my hand, this is called a woody. Now, do you do that when the iron's hot, Ed? Yeah, okay. when the iron's hot. Okay, okay, when the iron's hot, then you clean it with wet. A very, I'm showing you very what it's supposed to look like. This iron isn't hot. Sponge. This is how I put my irons away. Mm -hmm. When I'm done, this is what it looks like. I put it away, I let it cool, and I hang it up, okay? So, this is what we're doing now. This iron, y'all, this one's hot, okay? This is my favorite iron. And I'm going to tell you the part number on this iron. It's on our website. They are in stock. This is a $100 soldering iron. This is called the Weller. This is the Weller 1175 soldering iron. And I love it, okay? I'm going to tell you right now, I love this soldering iron. And I use, I go through maybe, maybe two of them a year. What I really like about this soldering iron is the fact that the tip changes out like this. It unscrews, okay? So this iron's hot. And just a little quick little watch. Junk, junk, junk. And that is a beautiful tip. Okay. So now what I want to show you is when you're taking your soldering iron, those of you that aren't using a wattage controller or being able to control the temperature of your iron, that's what you get right there. Can you see that? Put it up to the There we go. Can Don't you... move it around. Hang on. Just put it right there. And oh. Let me focus on it. There we go. Right, right, right there. there. Okay. So I want you to, I'll drop it down a little bit. There we go. Okay. So you can see it. You see how this is all eaten up around here and everything? Y'all, this is from not using a iron con temperature controller. It. This is really sad because, you know, this tip on this iron is the biggest part of the 1175 iron. This is the $60 tip. Now, I'm showing you this tip because this came to me in a box of tools that someone gave us. If my iron ever looked like that, I would be embarrassed to show it to you. But this is not how it's supposed to be, okay? So keep in mind, this iron tip here is just completely shot. And this is what not to do, okay? So keep in mind, and your soldering irons, I'm sorry, Barb. Your soldering irons are basically tools that, you will have to replace them eventually, but I want you to know, keep in mind. So this is our 50-50 solder right here. I'm going to set this up right here, 50-50. And then we have 60-40, okay? 60-40, 60-40 right here. 60-40 solder has 60% tin and 40% lead. 50-50 solder has 50-10 and 50 lead. Because it's 50-10 and 50 lead, it's much easier to melt. Do you see that? Boom. Okay. But, there, you know, you may not think you need a temperature controller when you're doing copper foil because nothing's going to melt. Well, I'll tell you what you're going to do is you're going to break your glass because your glass really shouldn't be any hotter than maybe about 400 degrees for that that much time right there. Boom. Just like that. Okay. So the other thing that you want to do, your temperature control will control whether or not you melt your lead. Okay. I want you to see that. You see that? I'm going to turn it sideways so you can see the groove that I just melted in it. All right. So my iron right now, I've got it sitting on eight or 80%. You know why? It's too hot for my lead, okay? So when I cut this back, give it just enough time to cool down 
and I can take my lead now. Okay, just like that. And I'm gonna take, guess what? I'm, we're gonna say it one more time. Ruby Flux, everybody. Right here, Ruby Flux. Okay, so we're gonna tag that. We're going to a little bit, just a little bit more. Okay. So now we have a T, okay? And I've cut my iron back enough to where it's not going to melt my lead. See it? One, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. It's not melting my lead. That's where we need to be with our solder so that we have a beautiful... Well, normally you got glass sitting inside of these too. So <laughs> it looked good until anyway. you touched it. It looked good until I touched it. There we go. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so what I want to show you now <clears throat> is even though my iron is hot enough to melt the solder, it's not hot enough to make it bead up really pretty. Okay. So we're going to show you this is the 50-50. And I'm going to set it right there. We're going to take the 50-50. We're going to clean off the tip of the iron just a little bit. And the first thing we're going to do is, I want you to see this. You see that? My iron is too cold. My iron is too cold. I'm, I'm jumping this bad boy up to 80. You know, cold iron's great for tacking. But that's about all it's good for. So with cold iron... A little tack. That's it. You see that? The solder's barely melting. What, uh, Julie wants to know what you cut the iron back to. I cut the iron back to use the lead. I cut it back to about 65 or 70. And then I, I set my iron one, two, three on the lead. One, two, three. And if it doesn't melt the lead, then I'll turn it up just a hair bit higher. And then we'll go from there. So we've got this tack. We're going to solder some copper foil right now. And we're going to make sure, okay? Now, my iron is heating up, and I, I can just tell the difference already. I, I can, so so what I want to do is I'm going to show you all, those of you, soldering is the hardest thing to do, okay, other than cutting glass. You can do what, what I call a touch and go, where you lay your soldering iron right there, and you straight down and straight up. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. If you notice, I've got the chisel tip on my iron on the edge. Now I can just go right back here, let it melt behind my iron. Let it melt right behind my iron. Boom, boom, boom. So we're going to take just a little bit of solder. Just like that. So if we do what we call a touch and go, it makes a really pretty bead of solder, okay? So that, everybody, is our 50-50. And I probably, actually right now, looking at this, this iron is still just a little bit cool for what I want it to do. That means it's gonna be too cold for my 60-40 solder. This is our 50-50. I'm going to come over here and we're going to do our 60-40. And we're going to see how that runs on the same temperature. Keep in mind, the difference in temperature is only about 12 degrees, thereabouts. But it's a lot. So we're going to do the touch and go. Now you can see, too, that I, I only used... 732nd foil on this. And what, you know, once you've ran miles and miles of this, this is the iron is still too cold for the 6040. But a much nicer bead. But a much nicer bead. So what we want to do is we want to, you're going to have to, Reostat, y'all, the reostat is important, period. 
And I, I there's people that say, well, I don't ever use a rheostat. Well, uh, go ahead and start using it. You'll see your work will change a little bit too. Be easier. It'll be a lot easier on you. It really will. Um, so anyway, now what we're going to do, because we've, you know, we've soldered this. I showed you a touch and go. So that's, that's how we're going to do that with the soldering and everything. But now what I'm going to do, I got my iron sitting on 80. I'm cutting it back to 50 before it has a chance to cool down. Guess what? Nice damp sponge. I'm putting my beautiful quarter inch chisel tip away. And you know what? It's still tinned, y'all. And it'll stay that way as long as I take care of it. This is Ed for Glass Chat showing you about soldering irons, how to take care of them. And don't forget, when you're soldering, the finished solder bead is your finished I work. You. I got you on camera. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I was looking down. But anyway, so I hope that helped everybody out. You know, I... I um, I just hope that it helped everybody out. Soldering and cutting glass, number one's in the beginning and the other's at the end. And you know what? They are the two hardest parts about the entire stained glass process. Yeah. But I do like the look of the 6040 on, uh, on that bead. That's much That's nicer. Yeah. Yes. So again, you know, we got 60, 6040 on, the, on your left and 5050 on your right. And I had a question. Uh, if we can go back to questions right now. Yeah, that's sure. Okay. That's, we're good. Um, I had a question that was uh, about lead cane versus foil. Is there? A, no, no, no. Excuse me. Excuse me. We already did that one. How do you <laughs> determine whether to use copper foil or lead cane? Does it have anything to do with construction or integrity or personal preference? Actually, what the way I would determine to use copper foil within a leaded window is by the size pieces of glass. You can mix the two together with no problem. You can also mix several different lead profiles together to create a dimensional look on your stained glass window. I will, I'll mix the two. I'll decide to use copper foil if we're doing a lot of small intricate pieces within a lead window to make it so that it looks the way it's supposed to without hiding all of the small pieces. And actually, you know, because if you're gonna take the time to draw those small pieces and you're gonna charge your customer for them, go ahead and copper foil them so that they can see So them. you can see them, yeah. Yeah, I mean- There's no sense. Why draw them if, you're, if you can't, if you're gonna wrap them up in a piece of lead and you can't see it. So yeah, you can mix up that intricate, you know, mix that intricate work and do copper foil. Yeah, mix the two together, and, and it it doesn't hurt it. If, if anything, it makes your work uh, that much more beautiful. I think. Um, one more question I had come in. Um, the viewer said, "I see you stress grinding the edges of for maximum foil adhesion. Should we also grind the edge of any bevels we might incorporate into a piece?" Um, I would say yes, but what you have to be careful of if you're if you're foiling bevels, okay, is you have to be careful not to chip the bevels window glass or scratch, them. or scratch them plate glass okay that's that's what bevels are made of plate glass or float glass is very soft you can look at it and it'll scratch well not really but i'm just it's it's sort an of. exaggeration yeah. don't you can't push it across the table without it scratching. no and so. you have to be really careful my suggestion would be to uh if you're gonna bevel if you're gonna Grind your bevels. I would put clear contact paper on the back of them so that when you laid it on the board, on the on your grinder, then you don't have to worry about scratching them. And you want to go, you don't want to go, uh, you want to go, ah, ah, yeah, just, ah, goodbye. Yeah, just That's right. Very lightly take care of it. Now, those of you that glue your pattern pieces onto your glass, then you can flip that glue side down yeah. and that'll protect but you wouldn't be doing that with a bevel no. but you could use that same process then process, you're going to yeah. have to clean the bevels the 
that probably is a bad idea. Forget that. <laughs> you know the what? If you, you if you take a minute on the bevel and you wipe it down with uh, denatured alcohol, clean the bevels with denatured alcohol, the foil is going to stick anyway. But you know, if, if you're if you're adamant, I'm, I'm adamant Sometimes about using a grinder. To. Yeah, but Sometimes not on the bevels. To, but not on the bevel. Sometimes they don't fit exactly the way they're supposed to. Right. Bevels are made on the other side of the pond and they don't normally You can't fit. send them back if they Yeah, you fit. can't send them back. <laughs> and so, uh, and if you break one, you got to buy the whole cluster. So think about that. But anyway, yeah. be really careful with your bevels. Again, they're made of float glass. Float glass is very soft and they will scratch very quite easily. easily. Right. I yes. like to take the bevels hold them up into the light and make sure there's no scratches and then always wrap them in paper towels and handle them as one at a time. As just wrap them one at a time, you know, okay. put them in paper towels. Cause like Barb said, gosh, there's nothing worse than getting a windy together and, bevels and scratch. having scratched bevels. Okay. Um, Magali, hey. said she wanted to let us know that after you informed us to use baking soda to make our patina darker, she finally did it, and OMG, it worked awesome. Great. I'm glad. I'm happy for you, Magali. Thank you, Magali. I'm glad thank it worked for yeah, you. Yeah, and thanks for telling everybody that's watching the channel tonight because it does work. Yeah. It's um, awesome. Yeah. So the you want to tell them what that is? Well, when you, when you patina your work, okay, prior to that, and like we talked last time, everybody, here's the thing. If you're too tired to complete the entire process when you're done soldering your window, wait till tomorrow and do it all at one time. So what, once you solder your window, you're gonna take some baking soda and water, mix it up, and you're gonna wash your window down. And that baking soda is gonna neutralize the acid from your flux. By using a 60-40 solder on your copper foil, the patina tends to stick better because it's an acid to the tin. So if you use a 60-40, you're going to have 40% cot lead and 60% tin, which is going to also give you a darker patina. However, when you put that patina on after you've cleaned that window, that's it. It's as dark as it's going to get at that particular time and forever. Wash it off, clean your window good, and complete your finishing process, and you will love it. You will love it. Just want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Joyce, a.k.a. Martinez. Uh, hi. And someone else came on. Uh, I guess I said hi to Christy and Magali. And who else yeah. came hi, on? Hi, everybody. Thanks hi, for Hi, everybody. In thanks tonight. for coming on and thanks <clears throat> for being here with us. I have one more question that came in. How much do you think the adhesive strength is diminished? due to the heat of soldering uh dr dramatically because the heat once you burnish it now you've already heated up the glue and it's sticking to the lead now you're going to put 412 degrees to it and you don't you can't the thing about it if you dilly dally it's going to separate okay so that's why you need to get the temperature right in your iron there's a lot of a lot of variables come into play when you're soldering y'all if your solder is too hot and you spend too much time on your copper foil and your foil lifts up, guess what? Take it out and start all over. You have to. Make a new piece. You have to. You can't you can't unring a bell. How about that? Does that make any sense? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. Once it starts to delaminate off the glass, just take it out and refoil it because there's no other, you know, there's no other choice to do it. Right. Um so Magali said, asks, um, can patina go bad? She lives in Florida and she keeps it in a tote Tupperware in the garage. The garage has no AC and she's in South Florida. Yeah, no, Magali, I, it's a, it's a chemical. It's an acid. Um, so yeah, all you have to do is make sure you shake it up really well because the, uh, the chemicals inside the acid, inside the bottle for the black patina or the copper patina. As long as you shake them up really well before you use them, they'll be fine. Yeah, They won't evaporate once on the, the lid's on it, you know. Yeah, sediment on the bottom is normal. Yeah. Okay, we have another question sure. about foiling. 
Um, this is Cole. We hope we're doing great. We are. And thanks for asking. Uh, he mostly or he or she mostly works with lead cane, but I'd like to try doing some decorative soldering with foiling to get the look of branches or stems. Any recommendations on the process? Well, Excuse me. a couple different ways that you can do branches and stems is that you can use copper sheeting and cut it out with uh, shears. Now, I, I would use, I, I like the idea of cleaning the glass really well and using copper foiled tape and wide tape and adhering it really well and then taking my X-Acto knife and cutting off what I don't want to see and copper making sheeting. the branches. Yeah. Yeah. Copper sheeting is great because it's going to give you a three dimensional look on your work, which is to me, if anytime you can add something to your work and separate yourself from everybody else, you have accomplished something that you didn't even know you wanted to. So yeah, I would, it'll you wanna, set you apart. It'll set you apart, man. Just you do that three dimensional work and it is awesome. And that copper sheeting. You is, cut it with scissors. You don't need anything special. Does it have adhesive? It on has the, the adhesive on okay. the back of it too. So it's a, it's a pretty heavy adhesive too. I, it's a little bit stickier. If I remember. Yeah, it comes in 12 by 12 sheets and, and probably right now they're probably $20 a sheet. They used Doesn't to be. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. What it's going to do though, is it's going to give you the ability to set your work away from everybody else's. So. Okay. We have another question from Susan B. Hi, Susan. Good question, Cole. Thank you very much. Uh, Susan has a question. A friend was wondering if residual solder with lead on a soldering iron might be a problem making jewelry with lead-free solder and maybe a de dedicated lead-free iron would be a, a good idea. I think a dedicated iron would be a great idea. That's a great idea. It's a great mm -hmm. idea. If you're going to use silver solder, 95.5, uh, or with the Stay Bright, I would get my own iron just for doing that. Not that you're going to spill enough lead over into a, a earring off of an iron to kill somebody. But you know what? If you knew in your mind's eye that that iron was only used for jewelry, then you would never have a problem with it. You'll be, you'd be fine with it. Yeah. And, and, and you can say that to your customers. I don't mix my jewelry and my stained glass together. <laughs> yeah. I think you'll have a better product as well. Not, not mixing. Up, yeah. Not, not mixing, mixing it. it up. Yeah, not Keep mixing. your iron nice and clean for that silver. That's so expensive. Yeah. Cause that's stay bright. I'm looking at it. That stay bright solder for a pound is about $75. So yeah, get your own iron for that and don't, don't mix it. And, uh, it's it's that stay bright. I hadn't realized just how much it it was now, Barb. You know, when I looked it up, it was crazy. Um, Rocky Raccoon, Rocky Raccoon. <laughs> I love that. Rocky the Raccoon. Yeah. Um, how do you clean an old lead cane piece to accept a join with new lead cane? Well, what I use is I have a an offset drill. And I use a wire brush with a quarter inch shank on it inside that drill. However, my drill only turns 1250 RPMs. That's it. It's enough to clean it. And what you do is you, you take it and I don't know, you, you aug it, you know, <laughs> but you have to, you have to, the wheel's going to turn like this and I operate it back and forth so that I can, I'm moving it back and forth and there's no way that I can snag a piece of lead or pick the window up, but you're going to have to clean it really well. You're going to have to uh, use a pretty heavy duty flux on it, wipe that off and then grind it down just a little bit more. And then you should be able to make those joints look like uh, even though you're joining old came and, and new came, if you polish it correctly after you're done soldering it, uh, you should be, it really won't even know the difference between the two. But at cleaning it is going to be the, be the deal. And you know what? I'll go ahead and say this. Wear a respirator. Yes. Wear a respirator because the, the dust that comes off the bristle brush. Uh, yeah, you don't want to breathe bad. that. It's bad. Uh -uh. 
And you know, that, that lead is real lead. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's lead. <laughs> that's real lead. Yeah. Uh, Magali said she loved the plate on the wall. Oh, thank you, Magali. Thank you very Just a much. little something Barb and I threw together last winter in the glass last blowing winter. studio. We'll have more of them eventually. <laughs> and we'll have them in a lot of colors. You know, this was a really good live stream because we found out about solder. You told us all about solder. Well, I hope and, I did, uh, Barb. Soldering and how to take care of your iron. And we had a lot of great questions tonight. We so, did. Uh, I love it. And I want to show I want to show you this. Now, now my my iron's cool. Okay. You want I'm me just to gonna set it, it right okay. there. Okay, let me change the thing. So so my iron is cool. Let me get to it. And and y'all, I again I use this iron for my lead. You have to keep turning it to you. And I use it, I also use it for copper foil. This iron is available on Amazon, but it's available on our website. It'll The link will get you directly to the supplier that actually has it in stock. So go to our website, go to the merch page, tools and merch, get on the Weller 1175 because the link that it takes you to, that supplier does have some in stock. For $95, y'all, it'll change your work forever. Just remember, a good iron deserves a good rheostat, or it, actually it deserves a rheostat, period. Whether it's a good one or not, just make sure that you can control the temperature in your iron Thumbs up, everybody. Okay. Just make sure. Have another you... question, hon. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Go ahead. Come on. I just keep rattling on, but you know what? I, I feel like I think it's if exciting. you don't answer the if you don't answer the question with something more than a simple yes or no or blue or green, <laughs> what the heck, right? He gets excited. Okay. Uh, Flavia is asking: Is there a gold patina for stained glass? Uh, There's no, not that I know, not of. that we know of. The, but that's the, interesting. The copper patina. The other thing is, okay, here we go. You ready? Clean your solder really well and get a gold paint pen and do your solder gold. Because I have done gold solder joints on brass windows before on cabinet doors. That's right. It holds and it up looks really well. good. And it holds up. I haven't had any problems in 35 years. So gold paint pen. Gold paint pen. From Office Depot or any other office supply, get it, or online. But the gold paint pen, clean your clean your solder really well with the baking paint soda paint. process, and then paint it. Paint your just keep don't do it like your solder. Don't go and try and paint it like that. Okay, do it like your solder. Paint it, let it dry, and then you can take a single edge razor blade. Any that's on either side of the solder will come right up with a single edge razor blade, no problem. Uh, we used to do, I don't know if y'all remember these windows years ago, they were the brass came and you may still get them every once. The people may be still building brass came windows. I don't know, but brass is kind of a thing of the past. Right? Okay, but we used to build a lot of them and then we'd have the solder joint. So we always took that gold paint pen and touched up that silver solder joint with that gold paint pen. On the and brass and it looked really good. On the brass and it looked just like brass. So you might want to try that, but I don't know of a chemical that uh, unless, that will turn it gold. Yeah. Right. Unless it's something that's uh, on the market and I don't know about it, which could be. Uh, Magali has a question. What does it mean when you solder a piece and it bubbles and leaves a hole in your solder line? You are using way too much flux, Magali. Okay. She wondered if it was too hot, but it's. Well, you're flux. boiling the flux. But there's too much there. And there's too much there. So what's happening is that, uh, so I like to, um, I like to put my brush in my little bit of flux and then I dab it on the table or whatever. Um, and then I usually don't have to worry about it. But yeah, if, if it's bubbling or your flux is boiling, it's, it's not that your iron is too hot. It's just that you have way too much flux on there. Good question. Thanks, Magali. It is a good happens. question. Yeah. yeah. And see, everybody, 
on, store on and air tonight can too benefit hot. You don't even from think that. about it, and all of a sudden you've made a mess. But it can be fixed, so don't. Sure, it can be fixed. Take <laughs> it, wipe off the flux, Get and start rid of the over. Flux. Yeah, just wipe it off and start it. Yeah. You don't have to take that solder off that bubbled up. Wipe the flux off of the, the top of your panel, and then go back and, and solder it, and you'll see eventually, you know, it's going to boil out, and it'll be gone. Okay, Art R wants to know if there's anything wrong with the glass from Hobby Lobby. I don't know. I haven't shopped Hobby Lobby for glass. I did shop Michael's one time for art glass, mm -hmm. and it was twice as much as the local stained glass supplier that was an hour away, but still. Yeah. And I've heard that sometimes the, some of the glass at Michael's or Hobby Lobby isn't annealed correctly. So you can't cut it. The way we don't know that all that glass is art glass. I've, I've heard some people say it's not art glass. I don't know what it is. So I will tell you what it is. Does that, if anyone here would like to chime in and say, um, you shop at and Hobby Lobby and you love their you glass. Can, you may. We need to know. Okay. Joyce wants to know. Uh, yeah, that's something that I've heard people say yes, no, but everybody has their opinion. So I would just go and look and then go somewhere else and look. Right. And you make up your I, own I, mind. Personally, we don't buy our glass there. But that sometimes that's all they have. That's right. And that's all that all that you have. And it's understandable. Okay. Joyce asks how do you get flux stains off of iridized glass and you know i don't know why iridized glass well it, you know so easily well you know barb flux. that uh mm -hmm. when glass is iridized it's it's a chemical that's sprayed on it while the glass is still hot mm -hmm. not molten but while it's still hot so i I'm thinking it may have pores in it, maybe the the chemical. Oh, pores? That, I I I thought the chemical was um, titanium oxide, which is paint hardener, and uh, and I, but I'm not really sure. We don't iridize anything in our shop just because it is way no, way she, hazardous. She's talking about oh, I know stained that. glass, but oh, in stained well, glass. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it. Uh, some of the pieces that we have that are, are blown glass that are iridized, the the iridescence has a pour on it, doesn't it? It's like a texture. Yeah, and I'm thinking, uh, I'm not really sure. I noticed when I was many years ago, when I was making sun catchers, yeah. and wizards, and things like that with uh, iridized glass. It would stain easier than regular glass. But the key is get that flux off of there immediately. See, I didn't know all this stuff about baking soda back then. Get that flux off of there immediately after you finish soldering. And you won't have a problem. Yeah, because think about but it. But there's nothing you can do after it's stained. Your flux there's is an acid. Even though it's, it's a strong acid for cleaning copper, it's a weak acid on glass, but it's still going to stain it and it very well could oxidize that glass right yes iridescent glass is tough to work with okay magali said that the uh a lot of the glass in hobby lobby is made in china and that um and my understanding is the glass that's coming from china is not annealed like american manufacturers and that's the problem that's what I'm hearing, but yeah. um, you guys let me know. Yeah, because if you if the glass isn't annealed correctly, and it, you know what, every now and then you'll get a batch out of this country too that, you know, it could have been the the leer was off five degrees for ten minutes. Who knows? But if your glass isn't annealed correctly, it's going to be craziness to cut. Let me tell you. Just, and they. Yeah. frustrating and then they also sell the oceanside glass which is uh used to be spectrum right. so if they're making that oceanside with the same temperatures and annealing temperatures as spectrum did it should be a really good glass All right well oceanside so look for that uh oceanside they strictly make fusible glass now though right uh well oceanside it's all fusible does. It's, yeah. it's just all fusible. It's just regular glass, but I mean, it's all fusible. They just don't break it up. So if you buy it, you can either use it for stained glass or you can use it for fusible. Yeah, it doesn't matter. really a good idea. Yeah, fusible glass, you, is, you can use it for stained glass windows. Don't let the fusible 
set you aside. Christy wants to know the best way to make animal eyes for stained glass to make them look realistic. In your kiln, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to turn you over to Barbara because she is the eye person. Painting, paint it, paint your eyes. That's what I would say. It's so simple. Well, you can take a white piece of glass. The other thing too is you can you can take a white you can take a white nugget and some black tra tracing black paint and make a pupil and put it in your kiln, take it up to 1200 degrees. The nugget's not going to melt, but the, the pupil will act fuse right to the top of the white nugget and you'll be all set. So you can make think about that. Eyes. Make some eyes. You can make green <laughs> eyes, eyes and blue eyes. Eyes are fun. You know, yeah, eyes are fun. Okay. So you can experiment with that, Christy, with your kiln. Yeah, and you can. you can. Tracing paint, black. Paint, yeah. You can figure it out. Paint it and fuse it. And then put a piece of clear on top. Yeah, we're coming up to Wilmington here <laughs> in the next couple of weeks. So we're uh, I'm going to pick up a copy of that article about you, Christy. Okay. So um, Joyce wants to know if it is better to use gel flux or uh, liquid flux. Ruby flux. He, the, <laughs> um, g, um, liquid flux. Water, liquid water based liquid flux. I like the Ruby Flux. It's on the merch page on our website. But I, I like the Ruby Flux. You buy two quarts of it or two pints of it. I'm sorry, you buy two pints of it for about $30. And it'll last you a very, very long time. I purchase, I do a lot of stained glass and I purchase that about every six months. So, um, Magali said she's been getting a, uh, uh, she will be making a lot of eyes with her kiln. Oh, that's right. You're yeah. getting a kiln. She has a kiln. She has oh, it. Magali. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm just trying to see if I got any questions. Okay, Magali, you sold some things this weekend. That's awesome. Ah, see? That's yeah, great. More more. Weather's changing. Yeah, people are ready people are come to spend ready to money. spend some money. All right. And that's good because, you know, when you, when the shows are starting, you know, we've all been without shows for two years and I know it's been a lot, it's really been really tough on those of us that rely on the shows for our income. So Christy I'm, said she loves her kiln, by the way. Oh, I'm glad Christy. <laughs> that was a nice morning when you came over and picked it up. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so do we have any more questions? Got any on your list from this past week? No, I just wanted to tell everyone the, the uh, new video is about restoring vintage stained glass windows. Ed's going to take you through the process. He'll, we're, he's going to be talking about color selection and working with your suppliers and selecting color for restoration. Or would that be... Is it a restoration or a conservation? It's, it's kind of a little bit of both. It's kind of a, yeah, we built the window 30 years ago. The gentleman that decided to go through the bottom of it broke it out. And now we're replacing the entire bottom. We were able to salvage the top, what, third of the window, I guess, Barb or something, maybe? Yeah, third so he's going to show you how he manages to draw the pattern with part of the window missing. Uh, by using photographs <laughs> and then he'll, we'll start the letting process in that video and then the second video he's going to go over the soldering process and the finishing process again oh we did have some questions that came in about painting on glass is painting on glass hard painting on glass is another process I, I would say in the beginning, it's a little difficult, but I, I want to direct you to the seven videos that we have on our page that deal with painting on glass, whether it be just stenciling, shaping, scratching, or even shading 
those seven videos I hope will help you out. They're going to show you how to mix the paint. They're going to show you what paints to use, what brushes to use. Once you take a look at that and then, then come back with us and see if uh, the main thing you're going to need is patience and a kiln. So don't be in a hurry. And you get, well, actually, you're going to need a light box too to paint with, to paint on. So you'll find that if you have those three things, the painting will probably come to you. And it's, it's, it's really nice to add that to your work, I promise you, to add painting to it or to be able to see a border that's maybe broken or something, but it's painted and you can reproduce that for someone and make, make their day, even make their year. So. Christy wants to know, <clears throat> what's your favorite restaurant here in Conway, Ed? My favorite restaurant here in Conway would be probably the Crooked Oak Tavern. I, I think that has to be my favorite. And I'm yeah. trying to think. I just like their wine selection bar. <laughs> really? I think that I think that would be nice. Have a glass of wine tonight and a salad. Yeah. But Crooked they do Oak. they have a good the Crooked Oak Tavern. Yeah, they yeah. do have a wonderful, wonderful um wine selection and it's reasonable so so we're all happy about that does ray did ray pop in tonight barb no, have you seen didn't. ray ray no, he didn't. hope you're okay you're, buddy um just checking I think, in i think we're going to head out um oh best dishes there okay christy uh i Gosh, I'm trying to think of what. Barbara, you know I mean, I tell like them the what scallops. you like. <laughs> yeah. What? I like the scallops. <laughs> and for lunch, I like the uh, chicken lettuce wraps. And they have good salads. And they, they do have, have good. good crab dip. What and, do you usually get? Well, for dinner, sometimes, not not all the time, but for dinner, sometimes I'll get their, uh, their steak. I mean, you can cook steak at home, but when somebody else does it for you and it's about, you know, an inch thick and it's, it's really nice. Um, so a steak there I like, but I also, Barb, I also like their, uh, for their lunch, I take their, their hamburger, but I ask the cook to leave the bread off and make me a cheeseburger, a, a, a bacon mushroom cheeseburger wrap. So I eliminate the bread because I'm really carb conscious and uh, trying to live a lot longer so I can be around my grandchildren but I've, and be around Barbara a lot longer so she has to put up with me. <laughs> She's like, why don't you just eat some donuts or something? <laughs> no, no do I don't my do that. Gosh, no. no donuts. No donuts. I haven't maybe had a, a donut in a long maybe time. Maybe a little bit of chocolate and rice. Very, not food. very often. No, just, but... just a little. A anyway, little bit. Anyway. We try. So, but yeah, the, the Crooked Oak is good. We also have another good restaurant here in town called the Rivertown Bistro. And and then we have the Taqueria down on the river. On the river. So you can eat outside. You can enjoy the bistro upstairs and outside on the balcony. Or you can enjoy, enjoy the Crooked Oak Tavern here in beautiful downtown Conway, South Carolina. Yeah. Okay, everybody everybody we're going to head out of here we're going to go get a bite to eat we might go have a glass of wine y'all well, have a great we want to thank y'all for a beautiful hour and 19 minutes yeah i mean this is the longest live stream this we've ever great, had and we appreciate y'all we can't do it without you the, the uh channel is growing again and we have things coming up you, and yeah. we have things coming up and so don't forget cut off is sunday for your questions to be aired on Monday. So get us your questions this week. And Barb did put a link up to for you guys to join our newsletter. If if uh, if you saw that come across the bottom of the screen, you can always sign up for our monthly newsletter. We Again, we want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. This is Ed, along with Barb. We need you to subscribe. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up. Everybody have a good night. Thanks for tuning in. Have a in. nice night. You'll have... A great evening. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And I can't get out of it. That's okay. You know, before. We owe y'all two minutes because we couldn't <laughs> figure out what happened. 
before it just left us. Okay, guys, I think it's going to work now. Have a great day.